Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Okay, so today's talk comes from the Majjhima Nikaya. It's Majjhima Nikaya 113 and it's entitled The True Man. And I think this is a particularly interesting sutta because it deals with our relationship to experience and how, if we're not careful, that relationship uh, can take us off track. So let's have a look here. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sabati in Jetta's Grove and Athapindika's Park. There he addressed the bhikkhus thus. Bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, I shall teach you the character of a true man. And the character of an untrue man. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, the Bhikkhus replied. The Blessed One said this. Bhikkhus, what is the character of an untrue man? Here, an untrue man has gone forth from an aristocratic family. Considers thus, I have gone forth from an aristocratic family, but these other bhikkhus have gone forth from, have not gone through, forth from aristocratic families. So he lords himself, praises himself, and disparages and treats with contempt the others because of his aristocratic family. This is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of one's aristocratic family that states of greed, hatred or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not have gone forth from an aristocratic family, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his aristocratic family. This is the character of true man. So here we have uh, a discussion around the nature of greed, hatred, and delusions, not because of uh, the status or the uh, position from birth or whatever, the greed, hatred and delusion are eliminated. And the greed is our attachment to the sense realm and the sensory experience. Uh, uh, hatred is our aversion, if you like, to that. And the delusion, of course, is this taking it all personally, this identification with it. And here, the untrue man is identifying with their outward status. Uh, Moreover, an untrue man who has gone forth from a great family or a wealthy family, from an influential family, considers thus. I have gone forth from an influential family, but these other bhikkhus or students have not gone forth from an influential family. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his influential family. This too is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of one's influential family that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not have gone forth from an influential family, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, enters upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his influential family. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, an untrue man who is well known and famous considers thus, I am well known and famous, but these other bhikkhus are unknown and of no account. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his renown. This too is the character of an untrue man. 
But a true man considers thus. It is not because of one's renown that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not be well-known and famous, yet if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his renown. This too is the character of the true man. Moreover, an untrue man who gains robes, arms, foods, resting places, and requisites of medicines considers thus, I gain arms, food, robes, resting places, and requisites of medicine, but these other bhikkhus do not gain these things. So he lords himself and disparages others because of gain. This too is the character of the untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of gain that states of greed, hatred, or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone has no gain, yet if he entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way, and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of gain. This, too, is the character of a true man. Moreover, an untrue man who is learned, who is an expert in the discipline, who is a preacher of the Dharma, considers thus, I, uh, I am a preacher of the Dharma, but these other bhikkhus do, are not preachers of the Dharma. So he lords himself and disparages others because of gain or because of the preaching of the Dharma. This too is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of preaching of the Dharma uh, that greed, hatred, and delusion are destroyed. Even though someone has no, it does not preach the Dharma. Yet, if they have entered upon the way and accord with the Dharma, accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the way of practice first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of preaching the Dharma. This too is the character of a true man. So this echoes something that uh, Bandi Ramsey always included every morning when uh, on retreat. And it was the last two verses of uh, the Dharmapada that he uh, was quoting, verses 19 and 20. Though a person recites sacred texts, but doesn't act accordingly, that heedless person is like a cow herd who counts others' cows. They have no share in the fruits of the holy life. Though a person recites the sacred text very little, so that may be the knowledge of the Dharma and, and preaching the Dharma, for instance, but acts in accordance with the Dharma. They give up lust, hatred, and delusion. So this is the greed, hatred, and, and delusion. They truly know what is good, and this leads to a mind that is free from suffering. They cling to nothing here and in the future. In this way, one shares the fruits of the holy life. So this is echoing, if you like, these lines of, of the Dharmapada. And the Buddha goes on. In, in, moreover, an untrue man who is, who is a forest dweller, who is a refuse rag wearer, an alms food eater, a tree root dweller, a charnel ground dweller. So a charnel ground would be where uh, the bodies of the deceased would be laid out for their families to collect them. An open air dweller, a continual sitter. So sometimes we find situations where uh, people can judge, uh, you know, their, their capacity or assess their own capacity by their ability to, to sit for periods of time. And any bed user, a one-session eater, 
So all of these different possible sort of categories of, of, of defining oneself in terms of one's practice considers thus, I am, whichever of these, you know, fill in the space if you like, uh, a one session eater, but these other bhikkhus are not one session eaters. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his being a one session eater, for instance. This too is the character of an untrue man. But a true man considers thus, it is not because of being a one session eater that states of greed, hatred or delusion are destroyed. Even though someone may not be one of these things, a forest dweller, a refuse wear, rag wearer, an alms food eater, a tree root dweller, a charnel ground dweller, an open air dweller, a continual sitter, an any bed user, a one session eater. Yet, if he has entered upon the way that accords with the Dharma, entered upon the proper way and conducts himself according to the Dharma, he should be honored for that. He should be praised for that. So putting the practice of the way first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his being a one session eater or anything else. This too is the character of a true man. So here, what we're looking at is that the importance is the fact that you've entered into the Dharma, entered into the truth, if you like, or the understanding. So if we could paraphrase that perhaps as, are we seeing behavioral change because we're engaging with the Dharma um, rather than just uh, this, these outward manifestations of our practice? But then the Buddha then moves inward and looks at inward manifestations of the practice. Moreover, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. He considers thus, I have gained the attainment of the first jhana, but these other bhikkhus have not gained the attainment of the first jhana. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This is the character of an untrue man. So this is very interesting because it's not possible to enter jhana unless the hindrances are, are absent. So the in, hindrances drop away and jhana arises. So then this attitude must come when this untrue person comes out of jhana and reflects on their, their capacity and ability, because then the hindrances are back, and part of those hindrances will feed into this, this greed and hatred and, and delusion. Uh, and so what we can take from this is that it's not just the attainment of the jhanas which represent progress, because if that were the case, then you couldn't be an untrue man and attain a jhana. So we need to have a, a, a reflection, if you like, about what does it mean to attain a jhana? And what does it mean to be a true man rather than an untrue man? And so what we're looking here is that not only is it the capacity to move through the jhanas, but there must also be something else happening that maintains this, this uh, truth, if you like, rather than non-truth. But a true man considers thus, non-identification even with the attainment of the first jhana has been declared by the blessed one for in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This too is the character of the true man. So what does it mean by non-identification? Well, if we identify with aspects of the first jhana, 
we're moving away from the practice that uh, clearly the Buddha is implying, but the practice that Bhante Van Ramsey described. So what does it mean by non-identification? Well, remember, each jhana has certain factors which make it up. So initial and examining thought in the first jhana, uh, pity, so joy. Um, we have uh, a, a, some mindfulness, we have some equanimity. Uh, so these factors, if we're not careful, will take personally. So then our movement has gone away from being with the state of the first jhana and just using that as an anchor with our practice to identifying with. And when we identify with something, and this tends to move us into a single point of concentration. So we take one of the factors of the jhana and we begin to make it me, mine or my own. And that's what identification means. So then we're beginning to absorb into or become one pointed with a factor of the jhana. And if we do that, then we have this sense of ownership of it because we become, as it were, that jhana. Uh, we absorb into it. But what Bantagrin Rams is describing is that we should remain aware, not only of the jhana, but of other factors as described in, in um, sort of MN111. So there's a whole series of other factors that we should uh, be aware of. And if we quickly go back to, to 111, um, in the description of the first jhana, uh, what we see is that in the states of the first jhana, the initial, uh, the, the, um, the thinking and examining thought, the rapture, the, uh, the pleasure, the unification of mind, the contact, the feeling, perception, volition, the mind, the zeal, the decision, the energy, the mindfulness, the equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by Sariputta one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. So this is this wide awareness that we need within the jhana rather than the identification with the factors. So then identification with the factors becomes one of the hindrances if we're not careful because it will stop our practice developing because we identify with that aspect. So non-identification, even with the attainment of the first jhana has been declared by the blessed one. For one, for in whatever way they can see, the fact is ever other than that. So here's a, a, a real invitation to begin to see what's going on because the conceiving mind can only conceive things that it already knows because that's part of our conceptual mind. In order to have a concept, we've got to have had an, a history of seeing something or knowing something. And yet as we move through the jhanas, what we want to do is gradually move to an awareness and, a, and a, um, an acceptance of the non-conceptual mind. Because if you think about the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, it's moving the mind into the non-conceptual state. So conceiving is something that we need to gradually release away from because our conception of cessation, and if cessation is, is uh, if you like, in a, uh, in a constructive sense, then as we come out of cessation, we have a mind that is prepared to experience the non-conceptual, which is nirvana. So anything that we conceive, if we work at conceiving through the jhanic states, we're training our mind to work with conception rather than, or conceiving, rather than non-conceiving. And as Bhante used to say, all you need to do is develop a mind that can observe. 
not think, not construct ideas, not identify with, but simply observe what is going on. And Bhante's description of mindfulness was the process of seeing how mind moves from one object to another. So if we have conceiving going on, then we fall into this trap for in whatever way they conceive. So this is someone who identifies with the jhana. The fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of the first jhana. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, with the stilling of initial and uh, sustained um, and examining thought, a true man enters upon and abides in the second jhana. And what we, what we have here then is a, is a process of gradual cessation. So in the first jhana, what ceased are the hindrances. And we can't move into first jhana if the hindrances are present. So they have dropped away. And to move into the second jhana, then this uh, initial and examining thought drops away. So we're moving from a, an environment of complexity towards simplicity as we begin to move through the jhanas. But also, but if we have a conceiving mind, we will tend to move into or maintain a complexity in the mind because we're always looking to explain and to own and to uh, identify with the experiences as we go along. But anything that we identify with builds complexity, but we're moving in the direction of simplicity. So we need to move away from this identification in a progressive way as we go through. So same applies with the second jhana and then with the third jhana, the fading away of pity or rapture. So this is another degree of, of cessation. We have pleasure, sukha, uh, this ease, this contentment. Um, we have uh, mindfulness, we have equanimity present. And then with the abandoning of sukha and with it dukkha, so the abandonment of pleasure and pain, uh, we abide in a state of mindfulness and, and equanimity. Uh, furthermore, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, so this is when the body begins to disappear. And um, why does it disappear? Well, largely speaking, because we've been working through a progression. And as we work through that progression, we're releasing more and more tension. So the body tends to disappear. Because the brain's conception, if you like, of where the body is and how it is, is based on the experience of tension in the body. It gives the sense of location, identification, and um, uh, it's a response to mental states, the degree of tension we have. And of course, we're releasing mental states. And with it, we're releasing this tension. With the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact. So as we withdraw from the physical body and move into the mental realm, um, or the, sense, the, sensory, uh, the five sensory impacts uh, decrease because they're body-based the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, and the, and the touch of the body. But remember in, in Majjhima Kaab 111, the Sariputta says, well, but there's still contact. So there's still aspects of the body which are present when they occur, because this isn't a state of absorption, it's a wide state of awareness. So at this stage, you know, if a fly lands on your arm, you'll notice that. It's not that we're absorbed into the, into the jhana itself, so that we're oblivious of, of anything else.
Moreover, with the complete surmounting of perceptions of form, with the disappearance of perceptions of sensory impact, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the infinite space. So even in the Arupa Jhanas, this identification can still continue. Moreover, by complete surmounting of the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of infinite consciousness. So the way this sutta is paraphrased is not describing the, the nature of the true man, but the true man, remember, if I go back and, and just look at a previous paragraph, um, but a true man considers non-identification even with the attainment of infinite consciousness, for instance, has been declared by the Blessed One, or in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of infinite consciousness. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of nothingness. So we continue. Uh, we can still identify with this jhanic state, even in these uh, high arupa jhana uh, states. Uh, the equanimity is there, but the, the equanimity does not take away the identification. So what takes away the identification? But a true man considers thus, non-identification even with the attainment of the state of nothingness. So this must be a movement of mind, the choice not to identify. And that means that the inclination of the mind must be as described by Sariputta, in one, one, one. And what is the non-identification that Sariputta describes? Well, he describes uh, that uh, all of these states of mind that he sees, but he sees them in a particular way. Each of these states were defined by him. In other words, seen clearly by him, one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus. So these states, not having been, come into being. Having been, they vanish. As a consequence of seeing that aspect of the jhanic factors, regarding those states, he abided unattracted unrepelled, in other words, with a balance of mind, not holding on, not pushing away, but certainly not identifying, because that's a holding on. Independent. Uh, so seeing that these states are independent of me, mine, my own. So by seeing them arise and, and fall away, this is reinforcing time and time again, the impersonal nature of the jhanic states. So this is feeding into the non-identification. Detached, free, dissociated with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there is escape beyond and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there was. So here's Sariputta going through the jhanas, not choosing by directing his awareness and allowing his understanding to see the process that's going on. And when we identify with the state, we don't see this process because we're in the process of identification, we are so keen to, if you like, keep that state that we, we see it as, as ours or that there is part of me, or that it's, it's mine to be hold on to. These are the characteristic ideas in Indian philosophy around identification. 
So in that process, we don't lend our mind to see the impermanence. And if we don't see the impermanence of these states, or perhaps I should say, if we do see the impermanence of these states, then we can't sustain an identification with them because they're independent. They arise because the conditions are right for them to arise. They persist whilst those conditions persist. When those conditions change, they drop away without our control. So what this means to me is, as I read this, this sutta about the true man, is that we can change what we see, if you like, by the perspective we take. And if we take the perspective of owning something, that is what will be confirmed in our mind. But if we allow ourselves simply not to take that perspective, simply to observe, we'll see the underlying nature of things. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, an untrue man enters upon and abides in the base of, base of neither perception nor non-perception. So this is the, the, if you like, the highest state of equanimity. And the Buddha said, there is no higher state than this to experience. So even though we take this identity into the jhanas, we can still achieve this very high state. He considers thus, I have gained the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. But these other students have not gained the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. So he lords himself and disparages others because of his attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This too is the character of an untrue man. So here we're talking about this identification. Yeah. But a true man considers thus non-identification, even with the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception has been declared by the blessed one. For in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than that. So putting non-identification first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others, because of his attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This too is the character of a true man. So here we are, right on the threshold of, of cessation, and still we can identify with the experience. And in neither perception or non-perception, there's almost no experience to identify with. And so if you like, the way, I the way I read this is if we've cultivated this identity through the lower jhanas up to this state, it becomes a reflex that's reinforced. And so one of the things that we need to be very careful of is working at the lower jhanas where we can see this identification much more easily because it must be an extremely subtle holding on once we got to neither perception nor non-perception because there is so little. You know, Bhante would often say that you can't really tell whether you're meditating or not. You know, it seems like you're asleep, but you're not asleep because there's awareness. And it's only after you come out of neither perception and non-perception and reflect back, do you actually understand something of the quality of, of the mind that was there. And so at that point of reflecting back, that's when we have this risk of identifying with this. Because remember, in every jhana that we experience, the hindrances can't be present. So we can't be taking it personally at the time we're there. It must be a reflex when we come out of the jhana. And so one of the things to be very careful of, as I read this uh, for myself, my own practice, is to see that reflective mind when I come out of the jhanas. And that identification can be something very simple of, oh, that was a good sit, or, you know, I enjoyed that, or these things where we're making, um, the best way perhaps to think of, of, of taking things personally 
is not only the identification, but there's some sort of measurement, some sort of comparison, some sort of uh, judgment around the practice. Uh, and when we go through that process in our mind, that's what we need to six R when we come out of the jhana to see what's, what's going on with the mind. But a true man considers thus, non-identification with the state, uh, even with the attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception has been declared by the blessed one. For in whatever way they conceive, the fact is ever other than so putting non-identification first, he neither lords himself nor disparages others because of his attainment of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This too is the character of a true man. Moreover, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a true man enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling and his taints are destroyed by seeing with wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom, uh, almost invariably in the suttas, is identified with the seeing of dependent origination. And what is it that dependent origination shows? It shows this dependency, this conditionality. Yeah, that certain conditions uh, occur and something arises. Whilst the conditions are maintained, this is maintained. When the conditions change, this changes. Which is exactly what Sariputta in MMMMM was describing as his experience all the way through the jhanas. So having seen with wisdom, this student does not conceive anything. And the conceiving here is, is, if you like, the ego identity with any experience that distorts its, its true nature. It's, so if we want the clear sightedness, what's implied here is that we need to release away from this identification and the conceiving that is supported by it. He does not conceive in regard to anything. He does not conceive in any way. That is what the Blessed One said. The students were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So that's, that's the end of uh, that sutta. And I thought maybe we could just take um, five minutes or so just to come back into our own space and just sit comfortably. Relax your body so you feel the body is self-supporting without you having to engage in it. And if you want to do that, one of the ways that I find very supportive is to come deep down into your body, below the navel, halfway into the body. There's a, an energetic center here. And just by bringing your attention here and allowing this place, this energetic center to support you, you can relax the whole of your body. Relax your mind. You don't have to hold on. You don't have to tense this area. And let the body simply soften and release. Now, maybe you feel a bit of tension in your hips, in which case you can just rotate the inner thighs inward just a touch, or even have the intention to do so. But soften enough just to release the tension in your hips and open up your lower back. And then try just inviting the inner shoulder blades to drop down the spine a fraction, almost no movement, but with it creates a release of tension that creates space around your heart. Now softly smile and that frees up your neck. So now with a little bit of luck, if you're sitting in a comfortable position, you'll feel the whole of your spine is free. Relax any holding and bracing around your brain and softly smile. Notice how if you bring that awareness, 
you find yourself investigating other parts of the body, you notice tension or tightness. Soften around any tension and tightness, either around your brain or in your body. Remember, your brain is part of your body. And then bring up your meditation object, whatever you're working with right now. Don't resist or push, soften and smile. Now bring your attention to the sense of contact, either with the floor or the chair. Connect your breath. And then gently breathe in. And breathe out. Okay, so any questions or reflections on what we, or what I've been talking about? Ah, yes, Sarah. Hi Hugh, it was good, thank you. And um, I I enjoyed this one, and I my my I have a number of reflections, but but one of them that is um, pertinent is just how it how the sitter contextualizes the development of practice with uh, application in daily life, and it's a very um, I suppose. <laughs> a very pertinent reminder for us that whatever the effort and the development and the progress that's happening in practice, there's also the daily life actions and behaviors. And what we're looking for is an integration. And this, this feels very, very important. And so there's this whole emphasis going through the sutta about the, the 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 true behavior, I mean, in the sutra it's mentioned as a man, but just true behavior being one that's not lauding or disparaging. 
And so those are the kind of, if you like, the, the tendencies of the mind could slip into that in daily life, which might show a real mismatch with development in practice. So here the invitation is to witness the behavior in daily life that we have where there's a there's a kind of um the movement of mind is 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 going in one of those directions and then kind of look to oh what does that mean and how how to integrate the 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 what the learning needs to be of what's not yet understood so i think that's really um helpful and then just the other thing that comes to my mind about the lauding and disparaging is that we can um we can do this with ourselves and I think you, you mentioned something of that the kind of the measuring of ourselves after a practice and we can have tendencies to to disparage as well oh, that was a terrible practice so I'm not really making any progress and that's hopeless as as well as did well on that one and that so that identification that we do irrespective of of any other um outward communication is is very interesting to see that tendency always to be jumping on and and kind of no trying to know where we are so i i really thought the sitter was great for um bringing out that balance between our um both of these reflections of practice but also integration in life because really for me if there isn't the integration in daily life if the behaviors are such where there's communication that's not kind or behavior that's trampling on others irrespective of these extraordinary achievements in meditation states I don't understand what you know it there needs to be a basis of generosity in the way that we're we're interacting with other people and how we're connecting and collaborating so I think behavior in daily life can tell us a lot it reveals maybe more than people understand um for the for themselves Uh, yeah, th thank you, Sarah. Um, um, unfortunately, I, I, I lost connection on the first part of that. But I think I, I think what we're um, we're reflecting on here is um, the value of non-identification. Uh, things spin out from identification, and so the whole process of measurement and the, the whole interaction that comes from that better than, worse than, the same as. The Buddha said all three of these are not relevant, are absolutely not relevant because they're all processes of measurement and they all have then as their basis identification. And, and so anything that is, if you like, generating this worse than, better than, or the same as has its basis something that is, if you like, from the Buddha's point of view, false and um, uh, inappropriate. Uh, so I hope that's part of what, what you, you were, were reflecting upon there. Anyone else like to come in? Yes, May. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to add on, I actually had two uh, reflections or questions uh, related to this. Uh, I agree with Sarah, it's a very interesting sutta. Uh, uh, so my first question or reflection is, based on this sutta alone, does this mean, does this bring home the fact that the jhanas alone uh, are not deciding factors towards achieving cessation? Uh, they're mainly, they're merely, uh, what, what you'd say, what we can say, like uh, points or indicators that, yeah, we could be heading in the right direction. That, that was my first um, question and reflection. And the second one, which is related to the first question is, like what uh, Hugh, you mentioned earlier in terms of because we had not uh, overcome the, that process of self-identification with the states at every um, step of achieving the jhanas, there is this reflex that, could occur even when 
we are at the point of coming out of the night of perception or non-perception. So, so my question would be, would it be better to as much as possible, whether in daily life, whoops, we miss just lost few there. <laughs> Well, I guess we could still reflect while you dialed in, but you know, Sarah, you were saying, you know, um, the how much we practice the uh, process of non-self-identification or non-personalizing everything in daily life, because as we all know, with neuroplasticity, the brain works in terms of repetition, right? So wouldn't it be better to as much as possible, whether in our daily life or in our formal sitting, sharpen our mindfulness so that when we see at any point in time, whether we are in jhanas, out jhanas, in day life, whatever, when the, pro the moment we see the process of self-identifying, we 6R at that moment. And if we can train ourselves to continuously 6R, 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 6R then when, one, when all the conditions are right for one to enter you know, into the different states, wouldn't that be like quicker? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just trying to be efficient and effective. <laughs> I'm still in my so-called work-life corporate mindset. You know, everybody has to be efficient and effective. <laughs> I don't know. Any thoughts? May, what you're saying there around the, you know, integration, life and in the practice, I think where we're aiming for is for everything to flow together so that there isn't a separation. And, and certainly that's what Banti Vimalamsi said about meditation is life and life is meditation. So we've got Hugh back now. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Welcome back, Hugh. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, mate, I, I only heard about the first three words of your question, so... Um, uh, but uh, maybe oopsies, I think we uh lost you again. Mm, let's give it a couple more minutes. Tricky internet, uh, wherever they are. Where, oh. Definitely a teaching in impermanence here. <laughs> okay, so third time lucky. Uh, as I was saying, May, I unfortunately only heard the first three words of your, your question, but uh, perhaps in the interim, uh, you've uh, already discussed that and uh, uh, had an answer. But if you'd like to repeat the question, then please do. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't mind. So in the interim, we did have a discussion in the sense that it's better to, you know, incorporate the practice into daily life as much as possible. But the question was, um, based on this sutta and what we just read through, does it indicate that the jhanas alone are not deciding factors towards cessation? Ah, oh, well, that's a very good question. Um, are there, are there, uh, maybe, maybe they're not deciding factors. Maybe they, maybe they do lead to cessation, but maybe the quality of cessation is different. Uh, maybe, maybe there's something, something there. I mean, I, I, I haven't got, um, uh, I haven't got any uh, sort of evidence for that because the Buddha's the Buddha's previous teachers um, they were able to get up into uh, nothingness or neither perception or non-perception, but they didn't go beyond that. And those were ab absorption jhanas, um, or so they would appear because he he developed something different. Um, and in that development, he he defined a new word which was samadhi, and samadhi is a, a process not an endpoint. So subsequent to the Buddha's uh, teaching, uh, samadhi was incorporated, or the word samadhi was incorporated to mean other things in other practices. And in those situations, they're an actual destination. 
Um, but if you look in the suttas, you know, Sama Samadhi is part of the process of the Eightfold Path. It's not the destination. Um, and the word Samadhi doesn't pre-exist um, uh, early Buddhist literature. So it's not a term that was present in the teachings that he would have had before he developed his own teaching. So we need to look at that. And, and, and Bhante Varamsi has, has identified samadhi as collectedness rather than one-pointed concentration. Um, and uh, this seems to correspond to aspects of, uh, of the teaching uh, that's present in the, in the suttas. So I think, you know, simple, simple identification with jhanas and the, and the factors of jhanas, well, what we're looking at in TWIM is that the jhanas can be different. They can be soft jhanas, if you like, they can be hard jhanas, if you want to characterize them in that way. So there's a difference in jhana. So maybe there's a difference in cessation, um, but I, I, don't, I, I don't have any evidence to say that. It's just a, a speculation. Um, but what this, the sutta seems to imply is that the quality of uh, your experience of the jhanas matters the state of mind uh, or the awareness that comes from the appreciation of the dharmas and what they're telling you matters. You know, if there is there identification or non-identification, well, this is a different state of mind around the same experience. So if there's a different state of mind around the same experience, maybe there's a different state of mind around the same experience of cessation, depending on the way in which you, um, you uh, observe it and, and the perspective from which you observe it or the perspective from which you reflectively observe it. Um, I think this is, this is perhaps some of the questions that this sort of actually uh, uh, posit as, you know, um, without, without giving a definitive answer to that. But it seems to be a very clear direction here but, uh, and in the suttas, it's only the true man who actually goes into the cessation that, that disrupts the asavas. Um, so if I go back to that original, that this here, uh, moreover, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a true man, and there isn't a paragraph for an untrue man here, a true man enters upon and abides in the cessation of perception and feeling and his taints are destroyed, or well, those are the asavas. These are the deep obsessions of the mind uh, by his seeing with wisdom. So you can't see with wisdom in cessation. You can only see with wisdom as a reflective uh, recollection of what that uh, experience means. So if you've been reflectively observing the jhanas from a perspective of non-identification all the way through, then maybe you're training your mind to reflectively observe cessation from that perspective. But if you've been reflectively observing the jhanas from a place of identity, then this might give a different uh, experience of cessation that doesn't destroy the taints, for instance. Uh, but there isn't a paragraph that says that. Uh, so we can't say that that's definitive. You know, there isn't a paragraph which says the untrue man experiences cessation, but the asavas are not destroyed. So this is speculation rather than rather than uh, you know identifying this particular context. Um, I hope I hope that's uh, you know that's that's my take, my my understanding at this time. But I but I hope that contributes to uh, the question you asked. Yes, yes, most certainly. Thanks, uh, Hugh, for, for that reflection. And uh, I just want to mention, um, oh, it, it flew out of my mind, but yes, that's right. So um, what you mentioned earlier about samadhi um, as, a, as a term that's coined by the Buddha, but also that it's a process yeah. and not a destination. I think uh, myself included, uh, and a lot of people in the general public still think of samadhi as a state to get to, as no. in a destination at some point. Yeah. You could, uh, to kind of uh, address that image, perhaps think of it as a tool in the toolbox. Um, it's something you use in the process 
So it is something you need to cultivate, but you're not cultivating it for itself. You're cultivating it for where it then takes you. Yeah. Mm, interesting. So, so then the Eightfold Path, we can think of it as each of the paths in the Eightfold Path, they are a toolbox. Yes. There are two yeah. boxes that we use uh, collectively, and we need all eight of them to bring us to, um, yeah, <laughs> a state of and, and in, in, in the same way that the factors of enlightenment are. They, they, they are balancing factors which enable then the mind to, to move in a particular direction in a particular way. Um, and none of the individual factors are endpoints in themselves. After all, all of those are, con are uh, conditioned states. And think about where we're working to go towards the unconditioned. So they can't be the thing itself. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, pleasure. Uh, anyone else like to, to add anything? Uh, yes. Hey, hello, you. Um, I ha had a question about uh, the Dhammapada verses you. Uh, ah, yes. You, yeah. And uh, the last one uh, had a section that said, and uh, clings to nothing here or in the future, I believe. Um, but um, why is the word or the, the link clinging used instead of the uh, perhaps the craving link. Uh, because I or think the, included, the, maybe. yeah, the I think it's, it's a very good question because um, uh, clinging has a different characteristic to craving. Um, so uh, the craving is, if you like, uh, as uh, Bhante Brahmsi would describe it, as as the I like it, I don't like it, or the I want it, I don't want it, mine. Um, but the clinging is, is this story, this elaboration behind uh, the craving, um, which, which, progressively, which progressively develops. And so if you don't cling, you, you don't identify, you, you don't develop that story. And I think if you compare it to the previous paragraph, where you've got someone who's clearly identifying with their capacity to recite, remember, and from a brahminical point of view, um, which was the, which was, if you like, the the abiding abiding um, perspective at the time of the Buddha, um, the word was was the truth. So knowing the words was the access to to truth. Uh, it was that that was the part of the brahminical role was guardians of the word, if you like. Um, and so there's a lot of identity with that, and there's a, a lot of supporting um, concepts and, and um, uh, uh, perspectives and beliefs, and the elaboration of the word was through rites and rituals, uh, which others in society would go to the Brahminical um, uh, caste, if you like, the, those people with the knowledge of the word, um, for those purposes. Uh, and so you can perhaps can see from that process that there's an identification with the capacity to recite sacred texts uh, as being all that is required. And so there's, a, if you like, a holding on to, to that perspective. And then the, the person who doesn't do that, but understands what needs to be done, uh, doesn't cling to, to that, those aspects. Uh, of uh, that process of identification with uh, the word, N not now, not in the future, not in, not in the present, but they just simply um, see that what what matters is how they, if you in want in modern modern parts, how they relate to the present time, um, uh, and that relating to the present uh, is without clinging because uh, you can't relate if you identify with or you hold on to 
because you're already, um, if you like, filtering that experience. So without clinging brings them, you know, right up against the actual, if you like, the teaching and the experience, which the reciting of texts does not. I'm not sure if that, that answers, your, answer, answers your question, but... Uh, yeah, it, it, it does. Uh, thank you. Okay. okay. So, yeah. Um, anyone else like to, to come in? Um, all, all questions welcome because uh, I think uh, you never know what's going to come through uh, in a question. Yeah. Yes. I, I, yeah. I, I actually um, wanted to mention uh, we just had these uh, five minutes after the uh, after the Dhamma talk, mm. and that was that was actually quite nice. The, <clears throat> I noticed that during uh, you talking, I noticed all sorts of tensions, and then we yeah, so, and I was like uh, correcting for that, and then you know we just centered ourselves, and it so, somehow it immediately works. So I, I immediately just started relaxing and had a sort of um, naturally uh, upright posture. So that's something I'm, uh, I'm going to use more often. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of what we're teaching here on, on these retreats. Uh, we've got three, three, three retreats, three retreats going um, uh, in succession. And Gandhi uh, Dhammagvesi kindly invited me out to, to incorporate this aspect, uh, this somatic aspect into not only um, preparing the body for sitting, but also to see the integration of this somatic awareness with the aspects of uh, aspects of twin, and uh, they do they do knit very well. They are sort of kind of mutually supportive, um, and and so you get to a place where you can begin to use the body as as a map of the mind, um, because when we come out of a jhana, um, we're, we're we're back into the body. You know, when we have hindrances in the jhana, so we're experiencing the jhana and then something comes up and our mind gets caught. Once it's caught, we are out of the jhana. And so the body is available um, to help us go back in. And the awareness of the tension in the body and allowing the body to come back into the balance and how that corresponds with the mind takes us back into the jhana, you know, very helpfully. So... Um, uh, that's one of the areas that we're we're uh, working with it, with the groups here as well, and uh, uh, and the first retreat uh, uh, certainly. Uh, well, um, I, Andre, I, I don't know if you're still uh, listening and online, but Andre's just finished the first retreat, and uh, and perhaps perhaps you you'd just like to give your your impressions. Um, yeah, Hugh, <clears throat> feeling really nice now. Uh... Much warmer as well. Yep. <laughs> um, and yeah, actually, I'm, 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 the integrating is going very well. And uh, yeah, the yoga, uh, the Sukiti yoga and the twin practice, uh, I found that it went hand in hand very, very well. And actually, I find myself using the, uh, the techniques, the, the, the body centering, the energy body techniques, the, um, the 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 centering uh, all the time when I'm walking when I'm sitting down when I'm working and it's actually really nice it's kind of like it feels like uh, it's been a missing piece in the in the twin practice that's it was, it, was, it, was, it was some of the aspects were difficult to apply especially when doing mental work and things like that and I found that um, yeah a lot of these yoga yoga techniques are are, are really beneficial into outside when you you know areas of life and we're not sitting so yeah so thank you for that i'm very very interested in developing these techniques further and um i, I have my wife already very interested in tr trying to find some videos uh online of you guys uh teaching this so yeah it was very good okay thank you uh and uh so, so it's one of one of the things i think so it's it's so much a bridge uh, moving from the, the, the sort of classical sitting practice into, into daily life, uh, because we're moving our bodies all of the time. 
in daily life. And so often when we move our bodies, it's difficult to maintain that collectedness in the mind. But when we move the body energetically, uh, rather than physically, that collectedness becomes available because when we move energetically, we're able to release tension out of our body. So then that tension, when it arises, shows us when the mind's moved from that collectedness. Uh, and so this is one of the things that we can go, and this corresponds with, with Bhante Brahamsi's invitation to smile into everything in daily life, because that smile is the invitation to take tension out of the body. But so much of the time, uh, the smile feels like it's kind of put on rather than coming from within. Um, and one of the things that uh, this working energetically begins to make us very sensitive to the arising of tension because we don't need tension in the body to support it. So it's a very helpful uh, movement in. Um, so it helps move the practice from the sitting into daily life, but it is also the bridge from daily life into the sitting because we can incorporate the qualities of the sitting into daily life because we have this connection. So we're exploring that again in the next two, in the next two um, uh, retreats. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to, to sharing some of that at the end of that. Um, great. Anyone else like to, to add anything? Uh, if I may, uh, Hugh, yeah. I just had a very quick uh, reflection uh, regards to this sutta, regards to the whole practice, regards to how Bhante Vimalaramsi used to remind us right at the start of every retreat. He's always saying, I just want you to do three things. I want you to smile, laugh, and have fun. And when I think about it a little bit further with regards to in relation to this particular sutta, if we consider the whole practice as just a game, then that process of self-identification uh, is lesser. So we treat it all as a game and just, you know, think of it as we're just having fun. Then it's more like, yeah. And also he reminds us to have like a childlike nature to just observe and have fun, play with it, really. He says a couple of times in his talk sometimes just play with it so yeah that was a little bit something popped into my head yeah because I think the invitation you know if we're not careful uh, particularly if we identify with experience th that's a process of accumulation we begin to hold on to things and then we see the jhanas or the movement through the jhanas as progressive accumulations accumulation of skill accumulation of experience uh, uh, accumulation of capacity Whereas actually, it's a, a dropping away of things. So accumulation is a movement towards complexity. A dropping away is a movement towards simplicity. And when we have this identification, we, well, or when we accumulate, the tendency is to move towards being serious. Yeah, yeah, we, that's the sort of mind that we begin to move towards. And that's the opposite type of mind to the mind that Bhante Ramanamsi was, was inviting us to have. So the question in my mind is that, well, why is that? And of course, it's because non-identification does not create seriousness. Non-identification creates curiosity, creates observation. Uh, it creates the states of mind that support the factors of awakening. Uh, so, you know, this, this is this is what we're what we're working with, uh, and so uh, all of the time we're looking to take tension out because tension in the body is, as far as I can tell in my experience, directly uh, related to identification. Either things I like or don't like, or you know I'm neutral about because as soon as I start to measure, then. What am I measuring against? It's against a concept of what I think it should be. And, and, that, and that just takes me away from the observation that, that Bhante talked about. Great. Anything else? No? Okay, so perhaps we finish with the closing prayer.
May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So thank you very much for, for joining uh, today and uh, for all your contributions. Uh, and I look forward to the time we get to do this again. Okay. Thank you, Hugh. All the best with the retreat. Yes, thank you. Bye for now. Everyone, bye. bye.